Coming up on show 581, Electrify Canada breaks ground, the Porsche Taycan starts production, and Teslas are just too safe. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, your edition for Sunday, 15th of September. It's Martin Lee. This is what happened in the last 24 hours. Thank you, as always, to myev.com. Hey, you want Instagram? You should follow them. They've got a great Instagram account. Check them out on Insta, and not only can you buy and sell and learn about EVs from the website, but they'll keep you entertained as well with some thoughtful posts and funny stuff, some educational things as well, if you follow myev on your Instagram account. Well, Electrify Canada is breaking ground for the first high-powered charger, and I must admit... There's a blind spot in my knowledge here. I knew about Electrify America, clearly, and a lot of people do, but Electrify Canada? I'll be honest with you, it's new to me. How did I miss this? The Canadian arm of Volkswagen's You Did a Very, Very Bad Thing subsidiary, Electrify America. Well, that's broken ground for the construction of their first high-powered charger. Electrify Canada is going to install it, one of a planned rollout of 32, I believe. And according to Electrive today, the groundbreaking ceremony took place at uh, Toronto, the premium outlets, a shopping district in Ontario. And the first initiative from Electrify Canada. Well, Lorianne Roxborough is the acting president and the CEO of Volkswagen Group Canada and considers the location the perfect choice because of millions of shoppers that the shopping centre attracts each year and a variety of existing amenities. Well, the high-power chargers, you know the ones I'm talking about, they're the ones that will do CCS, they'll do Chalamo, and in some cases up to 350 kilowatts of power on CCS combo, although good luck buying a car that will go that fast because there aren't any well the porsche taycan will do 270 i suppose it's what we like to call future proofing the volkswagen subsidiary also said it will be the first in the country to implement the um, iso plug and charge standard uh, that allows drivers to just plug your vehicle in and you're already registered you've already got your billing set up it's a bit like going through road tolls where you've got your special pass or well, anything that you're pre-registered for you just pull up to the charger and plug the charger in and it just starts charging and it'll bill you later well talking of the Taycan I mentioned it a while ago Porsche didn't wait long to start making the car after they announced it uh, right after the unveiling according to inside evs the cars and components that are produced at porsche's main site in stuttgart zuffenhausen in germany according to a 30 minute long video which was released it includes the body shop the paint shop uh, component production and final assembly the new facilities at the plant are very highly automated as well, by the way, employees uh, of which there are 1,500 new jobs created by Porsche solely to put the Taycan together at uh, Ziffenhausen. Uh, they pay a lot of attention to details and quality control, as you can imagine. And staying on this subject, Dr. Stefan Weckbeck, I think I would say. His name, uh, Porsche's head of EV projects, sat down with an Aussie website called Motoring uh, for a roundtable interview at the Frankfurt Motor Show, and he was talking about battery technology. Uh, Porsche's improved relationship with Rimac. Remember, recently they took an increased stake, 15 point something percent stake in Rimac. Uh, an upcoming electric hypercar is now on the cards, and you can see why. All of these companies, why Tesla want to do it, why Porsche would want to do it, why uh, Mercedes would do it with their AMG brand, they all want a hypercar like uh, Mate Rimac made because it gives you mm, bragging rights, if I'm being a little bit cynical, but also a halo. It's a halo car for the rest of your brand. Your customers might be buying a cheaper car, but of course, you know, they could always buy a $2 million, $3 million hypercar that does yeah, 0 to 60 in crazy times. They can't afford one, but it's a bit like seeing your favorite racing team win on a Sunday, and then you look in the driveway and you're driving one of those cars 
on a Monday morning to work. It's one of those things that uh, you understand why car makers will do it. Now, I've got a quote from uh, Dr. Stefan. He says this, and I quote, our target is always, no matter what car we're doing, uh, to have the sportiest car in the segment. I'm pretty sure solid state batteries are going to be the next step. I think there's going to be a technology step in lithium iron batteries within the next few years. Uh, So there's different ideas and discussions ongoing, and there will definitely be a Porsche hypercar in the market, but I cannot tell you today when it will be and what technology it will be. If it's all electric, it might be an approach and it might be a Porsche designed motor, end quote. I'll pop a link to Motor One in the show notes if you want to read more. Right, final story before we get on to our uh, question of the week. And Teslas, it turns out, are too safe for their own good. Well, Folksam is a Swedish insurance company that publishes research about the safest cars in the country since 1983. This year, they analyze the damages that people suffer in car accidents on 324 different models. They determined which ones were less likely to harm their passengers. Of course, Sweden has a long heritage and history in safe cars. Volvo, of course, have a whole brand built around safety and the roads in Sweden. Obviously, it gets pretty cold and snowy and icy there. You've got to be a good driver as well. You know, it's not like that all the time in that country, but uh, some of those famous rally drivers and race car drivers from those Nordic countries actually because they grow up learning how to be great drivers but that's because the roads can be pretty treacherous treacherous at times so anyway back to the story um the list has been put together but they missed out Tesla but they didn't miss out Tesla and let me tell you why they don't have enough data now, there's plenty of Teslas being sold, according to Inside EVs in Sweden. Uh, the Model 3 was actually the 10th best-selling model in July. 453 cars were sold. Um, it was the 10th biggest seller in Sweden in uh, this summer in July. Uh, so why isn't it showing up in the records? Because it's too darn safe, according to those that have dissected these data and say, actually, we don't have any records, therefore we can't put Tesla on the list because... People aren't being injured inside them. That was a nice story to uh, to end on. Right, let's talk about question of the week this week. And thank you very much to everyone who sent me uh, emails and feedback on question of the week, asking you what your light bulb moment was with electric vehicles. We'll start off with one that is touching, very moving. And I appreciate Jean for sending me this and sharing and sharing with you as well. And it's obviously something that uh, Gene is happy to share. Um, and I thank him for that. Uh, Gene says, in December 2012, I was fueling my Honda Civic. And one morning, I was heading to the UCLA Medical Center where my girlfriend was being treated. And she ultimately died from AML leukemia. She and many other children in our neighborhood had contracted the same leukemia. There was a suspect oil refinery And I'd been hearing about Tesla Model S's, and at that moment, I decided I would have nothing to do with harming other people's children, even though the Tesla was four times the price of any previous car I'd ever bought. I made the plunge. I have happily not bought gas since February 2013. My current wife and my son also drive EVs, and they're powered by the sun. Gene, I appreciate you sharing uh, that, um, that personal story. Right, David Partington on his light bulb moment says, when I first started getting into EVs, and my light bulb moment was when I realised how our city streets will soon be transformed by reduced emissions and noise. As EV enthusiasts, we can't help but get excited about how much fun it is to drive an EV, but everyone, not just drivers, particularly children, will benefit from reduced emissions and noise when you also factor in reduced traffic from car sharing and other e-mobility developments like e-bikes and e-scooters uh, our cities will be transformed i can't wait to bring it on stephen murdoch says my light bulb moment was about four months ago when i saw the fully charged episode about the rivian ev i want one but it's going to be a bit of a wait to get them in australia and staying down under, David Nye in Brisbane. My light bulb moment was when we were visiting a small country town in Queensland years years ago, and a total stranger pulled up beside us in a Model S. I was admiring the car and asking questions when he said, 
want to take a lap of the block? Needless to say, I said yes, and wow, 100% amazing. I was instantly converted and have wanted a Tesla ever since. Daffid Chung says, While watching Red Dwarf one night, I stumbled on the info that Robert Llewellyn had a channel of his own. I had a look at a few episodes, mainly regarding solar and renewables. I became hooked, and very soon, I went back to the first one and viewed all of them. Thank you very much. Me too, actually. I think that, that was probably one of my... If it wasn't my light bulb moment, because I can't remember exactly what... I know that Dieselgate, owning owning the VW when Dieselgate happened and, and realising that, hang on a minute, I've been part of this, uh, that was annoying uh, and certainly set me on this this path. But, but I can't remember if fully charged... It wasn't the very first thing. Tesla Roadster... Uh, original Roadster would have been before I ever saw a fully charged. So uh, it all kind of blends into one. But uh, thank you very much, Daffod. Uh, Darren Bird says, My light bulb moment happened after we switched to an, being an all the EV household. We have three EVs, a Tesla S, sorry, a Tesla X and three and a smart electric car for commuting, uh, but only two drivers. I have to move the cars around in the driveway every now and then. It's uh, so much more peaceful and zero waste starting an EV and moving it just a few feet as compared to an ICE, which would be super polluting, as it would be a cold engine as well. Uh, my understanding with ICE cars is the short runs on a cold engine are bad for the oil and the gas. Electrons don't care. I hope you're feeling better, he says. Yeah, I am. As you can hear, my voice is still... I'm still croaky. I've still got a blocked up nose um, and some, uh, you know, sinus problems and stuff. But that was a real... Um, that was a, a bit of a, a dose of flu that I had, uh, or a really bad cold, at least, uh, over the last six or seven days. Pretty much wiped me out for the weekend as well. So thank you very much for asking. Yes, I'm on the road to recovery. And yes, you're right about starting um, petrol and diesel cars when they're cold as well. And part of what came to light with the whole Dieselgate saga was that regulators allow the car makers to do, to let out more pollution, uh, to let out more pollution from their cars, from their software, from their emissions control software until the car warms up. That is done in the name of longevity of the engine and it's done as a, a consumer thing because they didn't want people's cars wearing out too quickly but that is part of what came to light with dieselgate is that legitimately they're breaking no rules they're allowed to do this but yes they are allowed to spew out more emissions when the car first turns on if they were to try and apply all of the emissions regs from being ice cold it would wear the engines out so there you go uh, happy lung disease so they don't get in trouble with their consumers. Right, uh, Tudor is next. Tudor Costigan says, I was lucky enough to go to Walt Disney 20 years ago and they had a ride now called Test Track in Epcot. Uh, at the time, sponsored by GM. So as you came out of the ride, there were various GM cars on show. One of them was electric. It caught my imagination. But I had to wait 18 years, during which time GM, of course, scrapped their car. Uh, literally crushed it and um, now I can afford a Zoe a 40 kilowatt hour 41 kilowatt hour says Tudor hopefully it won't be another 18 years before I can afford a longer range EV and finally Rob Crawford uh, says mine was the first time that I saw Elon Musk unveiling the Model 3 I was so impressed with the car and Elon's Holsingly explanation of the next gen EV uh, the crowd and the spectacle of it all was exciting I got into the whole presentation which normally I'm never affected by such things I was hooked says Rob, thank you very much to everyone. There was way more this week, actually, uh, and uh, I appreciate all of your comments. And I've tried to pick out a selection there from from 20 years ago to only a few weeks ago, and that's the wonderful thing that uh, the community that listened to this podcast and I chat to you on email and on social media and stuff. Doesn't matter whether you've been into EVs for 20 years or 20 minutes. Um, it's a, a wonderfully accepting uh, community. Uh, the more the merrier. It's always wonderful to hear from people who are just getting into electric cars because everybody had their first thought about an EV. Everyone's thoughts, oh, what are the different plug types? And if I buy one, what plug has that got on it? And can I charge that on a so-and-so charger? And you, be, you get used to those questions, or you get, you get the answers very quickly, I should say, but we all had them. Uh, 
and uh, and it's uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from people who are just getting into EVs and, and people who have been following them for many years as well. Right, time for a new question of the week uh, this week, set by myev.com. Question of the week is this. What is your dream EV road trip? Take me around the world, please, podcast listeners. I know we have listeners in pretty, pretty much every country uh, around the world. So take me on a road trip around the world and tell me what is your dream EV road trip. Email me, hello at evnewsdaily.com and you can leave a comment on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you to 250 patrons of the show. Uh, your generosity keeps me going, uh, particularly my premium partners, Phil Roberts and Brad Crosby and Avid Technology. Uh, my partners of the show, David Allen, OEM Audio of New Zealand and evpower.co.nz. Hello to Paul O'Connor. Hello to Blake Boland of EV Life Ireland. Hello to tryev.com and Gareth Hamer as well. Got some news from Try EV. Uh, and the gang coming very soon on a future podcast and my list of exec producers I will do in a couple of days time it's a long list I'm not um, I'm not wussing out it's only because uh, as you can hear uh, I probably need to call it a day um, now but give me a couple of days and we will say thank you to everybody who is an exec producer there are 579 uh, sorry 580 previous shows online for free uh, get them wherever you get podcasts from new ones come at you first and free and automatically if you are a subscriber right have a wonderful day i'll catch you tomorrow and remember there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid